She is the headmaster of Great Hearts Irving Upper School in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And she and her husband for a very long time have been studying the area of technology and what is good about technology, what is useful for us as human beings, and what are some of those things, those pitfalls uh, that maybe we may need as human beings to learn some self-control around. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Amber Dyer. Though, as I 
been we use it to keep in touch with people. We know that technology has been used for many years to improve aspects of human life. You can see how since 1820, uh, the population of the world that's living in extreme poverty is down, so is the literate uh, illiteracy, it's significantly decreased. We know that technology is used to help human beings. This little boy just received co uh, cochlear implants in his ears, and he's hearing his parents' voices for the very first time. Um, isn't that outstanding and beautiful? Um, we have a friend from MIT, and her name is Roz. We're going to talk about more about her in just a minute. And right now, uh, for our last one year, she has been programming AI to scan human faces to help children with autism recognize and identify um, emotions in other people. And so she has scanned hundreds of thousands of humans in her advertising, in her, in, sorry, in her laboratory to see how they're reacting to uh, certain emotions. And so um, she's designing she's designing a technology in the earbud that can be put in the ear of a person who um, has autism. So he or she can have clues as, as far as reading facial expressions. So there's some really beautiful ways that technology can be used. And yet we also approach it with caution, don't we? We approach it with pause. Our high school scholars this, uh, this week read a story by H.G. Wells called The Machine Stops. And in this story that was written in 1909, the author conceives of an age in which the whole world has had to go underground. Is there a high school scholar who would be willing to come up here and just share uh, how the people in this story communicate? <laughs> come on, yes, come on up. not that much older than those of us in this room. And he's trying to communicate with his mother. And how is it that the people communicate in the story with one another? The way that people communicate is through a um, large screen. Uh, and uh, they don't like, see each other face to face. Think of like a FaceTime, but like way larger like, the size of that uh, projector board. Yeah. OK, and so there's a boy and his mother is there an exception, or do even are even families divided by this this technology that is mediating their relationship? Uh, the machine um, it dictates where you go once you are of age to leave, and you can be sent anywhere around the world through a system of underground tunnels, and um, the only way to communicate through this. Place. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. What had been lost by this human civilization that was mediated entirely by the technology to communicate? And if you're shy, that's okay. I'm going to share with you what we came up with at Great Hearts Irving. This is what the high school scholars said in their seminar rooms, the high school and middle school scholars. What has the world lost? They said that they had lost in having their communication mediated by this machine. They have lost family, religion, excellence, struggle, passion, uniqueness, freedom, physical touch, and embodied relationships. They've lost communication, connection, depth, self-reliance, muscles, because they were just sitting on those machines, right? They've lost friendship, nature, patience, happiness, strong will, the outside world, motivation, wonder, and imagination independence, and leisure for exploration. Those are the things that they lost. So today, as we think a little bit more about technology, I want us to think about that dystopian society that we, that we read about in high school and, and uh, middle schoolers. We invite you to 
find the story as well. It's called The Machine Stops by H.G. Well. But I want us to consider a little bit what they have lost and what we are saying no to in having a school that is tech-free and keeping our phones in our lockers and putting a limit on our technology. We're saying no to something very, very small because we're saying yes to something so much greater. Um, I was a university professor before I became a headmaster, and I worked at the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture. And one of the things that made me start, start thinking about technology um, more, more intentionally is that I started to see a difference in my university students in around 2009 to 2010. It was about uh, three, uh, three to four years after the advent of the iPhone. What I started to recognize was that on the first day of school, Rather than coming in excitedly, as you all did for this assembly, talking with one another, engaging with one another, I noticed that my university sophomores coming back from summer break were doing something that the media expert from MIT, Shirley Turkle, calls being alone together. Instead of talking with one another, sharing about what had gone on over the summer, they looked like this. Switching, switching, switching. The room was silent. They weren't engaging with one another. They were tied to their devices and they were highly addicted. I started noticing in my university students as well that many of them were struggling with anxiety and depression on levels that I had never seen over the last 10 years. And so I started to wonder and ask a lot of questions. I started to go with my husband to some of the speaking engagements that he was doing. And one of them, he went to uh, MIT uh, to go and speak with a panel from Harvard and MIT. And on this panel, um, uh, there were a lot, of, a lot of really great media experts that were thinking incredibly intentionally about technology. And including that friend of ours, Ross, who makes the AI um, at the MIT Media Lab. And so after uh, the other Dr. Dyer spoke on this panel and the speakers were going out to dinner, I asked, our friend who's running the media lab at MIT, this place that is going to be this central place where technology is made and developed, decisions made about artificial intelligence, decisions made about um, AI that's going to be used for Warcraft, decisions even um, a few years ago, there was even a human cloning project that was being considered. And so I asked our friend, Dr. Ross, tell me what these people are reading in this lab as they decide what kind of new technology they're going to make. And her face turned white, and she became very brave. And she said to me, absolutely nothing. We make it because we can. We make it because we can. Very little consideration was being made for how these technologies were going to be affecting people. And so, um, I found in that conversation that it was coinciding with a lot of the research that I was doing for the Dallas Institute. And that is um, this research that shows that the human brain, your brain, my brain, is not fully developed, particularly the part of the brain that's called the prefrontal cortex. It is, does not get fully developed until you are age 25, and sometimes a little bit later than that. So it's a very pliable, malleable part of your body. And what we were finding in the research is that screen time for young people was closely associated with the harming brain development. So much so that there are massive increases in teen depression, anxiety, and suicide since the advent of the iPhone. And so as I started to investigate a little bit more, I started to discover that the people making these technologies, people who work in Silicon Valley for Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple, the people who develop the iPhones, they don't send their kids to schools that use these technologies during the school day because they know their brains are not fully developed until they're age 25. These are highly addictive devices that affect the human brain and affect our capacity for happiness. So the Silicon Valley um, web developers send their kids to schools that are a lot like Great Parks, Western Hills. In fact, my husband and I went to Silicon Valley, we took our kids a couple years ago, and um, there was one of his, uh, one of our friends who's in quantum computing, who took us to the top of the Salesforce tower. And 
as we looked out across the San Francisco Bay at all of these tech companies, I said to him, so where do you send your kids to school? Do you send them to a, a STEM school, a school where they all have iPads, where they're on their phones all day, where they're using this technology? And he said, absolutely not. None of us do, because we know what this does to kids. We send our kids to liberal arts schools, and what he described was something very, very similar to Great Hearts Western Hills. Now, it used to be that it was the really, really, really rich people who thought that they needed the tech. And then all of the research is coming now, and now we're finding out that it's the really, really rich people who can afford to send their children to schools like Western Hills that are low-tech, high-human, highly relational schools. So with all of this in mind, I want to ask you a question. And this is a question that Dr. John Dyer asked in his first book, From the Garden to the City. Is technology good, bad, or neutral? Because I've just given two very conflicting uh, visions of technology. So raise your hand. How many of you would say that technology is good? Yes. OK, how many of you would say technology is bad? Yes. I know that you can engage with new ideas, and I'm going to give you a new idea today that I want you to ponder and hold in your hearts. And it's this. Technology is good, but it's never neutral. Let me repeat it. Technology is good, but it's never neutral. Now stay with me. Let's think about a most basic kind of technology, which is a shovel. A shovel. Okay. So we can, use, we can say that it's just how you use it that matters, right? That you can use it for good, or you can use it for bad. <laughs> okay, come back to me. Um, but let's think a little bit more deeply about this. What happens to my arms if I use a shovel repeatedly? You, sir. Yeah, what happens to my arms? Yeah, they get sore, right? Whether I use it for good or bad, it changes me. What happens to my chest? It gets more muscular, right? And what happens to my hands? They get tired, they get blisters, don't they? So whether I use it for good or whether I use it for bad, both times my hands will get blisters, my arms will get tired. That technology is never neutral. It changes me, no matter how I use it, for good or bad. And so we think about this quote. Marshall McLuhan came to University of Dallas, where I was a professor and administrator for quite some time. And he, uh, he wrote books before John Dyer did about technology and human culture. And he writes that our conventional response to all media Namely, that is how they are used that counts is the numb stance of a technological idiot. And we know that the people in this room <coughs> are going to get ahead of this. And you will not be tricked because you are pursuers of truth and goodness and beauty, capable of thinking more deeply about the most important human questions. So when we think about the iPhone, we can say that phones are good, we can use them for good, we can use them for bad.
representation of our humanity. Because every time we engage with a new device, we might add something to ourselves, but we also subtract something from ourselves. For example, I cannot communicate with you and speak as loudly as someone would in ancient Greece in an amphitheater because my voice has not developed in that way. This microphone that I have on today is an extension of my voice, but I no longer need to develop my voice the way I might have 3,000 years ago, and so it's also an amputation of my voice. We also know that technology extends sometimes the things about us that are things that dimensions of our character that we want to uh, that we want to form in the way of virtue. For example, our own narcissism. Is this young person holding a mirror or is she holding a phone? Well, it's hard to tell, isn't it? Because that technology of our day can extend. We want to think about technology about how it transforms us. And it transforms us in many ways the way that workout equipment transforms our bodies. So if we go to the gym, we know that we can use different tools and they're going to affect us. So we know that we can use a treadmill and it's going to give us longer, leaner legs for running. And then we also know that if we lift, lift weights, this will give us stronger legs for lifting. In fact, when we go to the gym, there are technology labels on the kind of devices that we use that tell us how they're going to affect us. But unfortunately, there are no labels on our phones, are they? About how they're going to affect our brain, how it is going to shape the way that we can feel happiness or sadness in the world or experience human relationship. I'm not the first person who was concerned about this. You're not the first person who was concerned about this. In fact, all the way back to Plato, Plato was concerned about the way that writing that technology of his day was going to affect the way that people could remember. Here at Great Hearts Western Hills, we are going to read uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Homer memorized those thousand-page works of ancient literature, and he wrote them all down, or the scribe did, but he memorized all of that. And so Plato was concerned about how writing was going to affect our ability to, mem to for memory. But I'm going to show you something that's pretty shocking here. And I want you to think for a minute um, about social media. Because remember, whenever you use a technology, you are cutting off or extending part of your humanity. So my husband wrote an AI program he asked me to tell him all of my favorite books. And so many of these are on the Great Hearts reading list. We have Homer, Plato, the Old and the New Testament, Aristotle, Shakespeare, Melville, Dostoevsky. And he added up the number of words, about 1.8 million words. And we read all of these books, and you will read these books and more in your career here at Great Hearts. And you do understand what a gift you have because most young people today have not had the opportunity to have this kind of education. I'm in Dallas. In Dallas, this kind of education costs between thirty and forty thousand dollars per year to go to a private classical school. Most people don't have the development of their brains in such a way that they can read the Great Hearts curriculum, which you are all doing. You are part of a very, very small percentage of humans of teenagers who can do that because at most schools, the kids are on their devices between 8 and 10 hours per day. The average teenager gets over 200 phone notifications per day. And what we know, what I came to understand as a university professor, is that by the time kids get to universities, they are highly addicted to these devices. I'm going to show you why in just a minute. But look at Instagram, for example. If you check it three times a day, if you only have 30 friends, and remember, the average teenager gets 200 notifications per day. So if you only have uh, 30 friends, not over 200, giving you notifications. You only read 60 words per post, which is kind of small for Instagram, and you check it 365 times every single day, 360 times, uh, 65 times a year, right? And only 300, only three times a day, not 200. Look at how many words you will read on the right compared to the left. 1.9 million. No, 
Now listen. Stay with me. You have to ask yourself this question. Why is what we see on the left so hard and what we see on the right so easy? Technology shapes us. And just as if you eat terrible food and you don't take care of your body, your body will be shaped in a certain way. Right now, as your brain is developing, you are choosing what kind of human being you are becoming. Are you going to be the kind of human being who can only consume, consume, consume short bits of insignificant, meaningless, fractured information? Or will you be the kind of person who considers the best that has been thought and written and said and lived throughout 3,000 years? Will you be one who pursues truth and goodness and beauty and meaning and your own humanity? And so that is the opportunity that we have. Um, there's interesting research about phones, even their presence. Uh, John came to um, a research study that confirmed about 60 different peer-reviewed studies that I um, engaged in as a university professor about even the presence of technology in a room. And so two, um, in, in, this, uh, in this study, two people were brought into a room with a table between them. And what the phone study shows is that when the table had a phone on it, and, and, and they weren't even talking on the phone, but just the presence of the technology in the phone and all of the emotion that that gives us about feeling like we're missing out and there's this outside world and so forth, just the presence of the phone changed the way they felt versus putting a book, a paper book on the table. The researchers conclude that interacting in a neutral environment without a cell phone nearby seems to help foster closeness, connectedness, interpersonal trust, and perceptions of empathy, the building blocks of relationships. What we need to know is that these modern devices, I'm going to show you some, I'm going to show you, you all some research right now that a lot of kids don't know about, so hold tight with me. Um, I'm, I'm speaking to you as the wife of someone who is in the tech industry, he is a voice of, um, he is a voice of, of reason and pause in the tech industry. And I'm gonna show you some research that I think you have a right to know. All right, up here I have a slot machine. And as many of you probably know, gambling can become highly addictive for some people. And in fact, here, this gambling is a, a multi-million, billion dollar industry in the United States. And part of the success of that industry is getting people addicted so that they keep on pulling the lever on the slot machine. I want you to look here on the left at the jackpot. Notice how when it hits the jackpot, it goes one, two, three. Notice how there's a pause between each one of those. Do you know why? Neuroscience. Because neuroscientists work for the gambling industry. They're hired and they work for them, and they know what will happen to a, a, a chemical in a person's brain called dopamine. Dopamine is the chemical that we get when we gamble, when um, other person uses uh, drugs, uh, they get a dopamine hit, and it is highly, highly addictive. And what the body says is, I want more, more, more. But what neuroscientists have discovered is that if we spread out the hit, it creates maximum addictiveness. So, for example, on Instagram, when Instagram blows, I used to think that social media was going one, two, three, because my internet server was pausing. So when I when I go on Facebook or when I even when I load my email, I thought that it was just because of the way the server works. No, Dr. John Dyer just showed me the code, and he says here's how they put pauses in to maximize the addictiveness. So I go to Instagram and I post a photo and then there's a pause and I see the likes. Do you know that if you are on social media and there are 10 people who like your post, that the web developers will only show you two likes on this login. Wait, wait, and then another four. Wait. Way. And then when you're feeling sad tonight and you need more dopamine and you remember how that, and you don't even think consciously that that 
gave me a little bit of happiness, and then they gave me the other four, delay. So it goes photo, wait, likes, wait, next to the likes, wait, and look, a sofa that I can buy and make me happy. There is a multi-billion dollar industry, the largest industry in the world, which is the tech industry, that is a thousand percent devoted to making you an early adopter of these technologies while your brain is fragile and developing before your age 25 so they can make money off of you. And this is unconscionable because do you know what Mark Zuckerberg uh, puts the price on your consumerism to be, on your humanity? It's less than $400. Every one of you, cha-ching, 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 getting addicted to this translates to $400 in their pockets. This is how they make their money. Tristan Harris, uh, a whistleblower from Google, who's a former design emphasis, writes that if you're an app, how do you keep people hooked? And he's talking about social media. Turn yourself into a slot machine. The average person checks their phones 150 times per day. Why do we do this? If you want to maximize addictiveness, all tech designers need to do is link a user's action, like pulling a lever, with a variable reward. This is called variable intermittent rewards. It's intentional. It's not a mistake with those low one, two, three. And so this is how it works in the brain. As you all probably know, there's two different major neurochemicals in your brain that talk to each other and they, your neurons talk to each other and they interact with these. There's dopamine and there's serotonin. Dopamine is that neurochemical that says, okay, that felt good, I want more, right? That's the one that gets activated when we go online. And then serotonin is the one that says, oh, that's good, I feel satisfied. So we get this feeling when we go for a run, when we are um, enjoying a conversation with our friends, right? And so there is this dopamine reward loop, and I'm showing uh, this is John's uh, description, uh, uh, model of what happens when we play video games, for example, because they work on our brains in the same way. So I kill monsters, I get rewards, I buy weapons, and somewhere along here, I get that dopamine release timed out from my video game usage. And so there's a gap, and what does my brain want? It wants more dopamine, right? And so what do I have to do? Well, I have to buy points, don't I? Social media works the same way. I use it, I post, I get the likes, they get timed out, they get spaced out, I get a dopamine release from that, but then later that day, I feel a little bit sad, and what does my body automatically go back to? It goes back to wanting that dopamine release, and I, I'm shown an ad that so I'll buy something. This is how they plan to make money after you. And I want to tell you that you are so much more, you are worth so much more than the price tag these tech companies have on your head. You are a human being of infinite worth. And we love you and we care for you at Great Hearts. And that is why we have a school that is preparing you in real ways for the coming days when you will be having challenges about uh, surveillance and, and biological um, enhancement and data privacy, uh, privacy and the energy crisis, you are going to have to be considering all of these things and we don't want you to have minds that don't know how to work through it. Now I showed this, I showed this quote by, um, in Dallas, uh, Mr. Cuban is an entrepreneur and he's a, and he's a tech leader. But even he has been going publicly to say that he doesn't want coders working for him as his first choice. You know what kind of people he wants? People who have deep souls. He wants people who have had the kind of education that you have here at Great Hearts. We always want to be thinking when we use technology, what should I use it for? How does it shape me? And then finally, what is the good life? What is the good life? We want to be human beings at Great Hearts who have lives fully alive. We want to be the kind of people who are not alone together, but who are together together. C.S. Lewis writes of the modern age predicting this um, conundrum that we will be in. 
that in vastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand function. We make men without chests, and we expect of them virtue and enterprise. And we do not want to do what the tech companies have been trying to do, and that is to make you early adopters of their technology. In my research, I found out that these tech companies pursue and court school districts, traditional ISDs, the way that pharmaceutical representatives court doctors with kickbacks and bonuses so that they will use their drugs. It's a big, big business. And we are nobody's school here. We will not be used from it. Um, this quote is from our dear friend, Dr. Daniel Scoggin. Uh, Dr. Daniel Scoggin is quoting an ancient poet, and he is the founder of Brick Hearts Academies. And when he was surveyed, he asked me to read a, a chapter of a book that um, he's writing about education. And at the beginning of it, he quotes W.B. Yates, who's one of our favorite poets, um, and W.B. Yates is commenting on the predicament of the modern world. He says, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. But Dr. Scoggin was such an optimist in starting Great Hearts Academies because he believed that education here, and this kind of classical education, can equip young people like you to be able to withstand the modern age and to really, truly really flourish in it. It says here, those from among you will rebuild the education ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called a repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. At this school, we are saying no to something very, very small so that we can say yes to conversation and community, so that we can say yes to serving other people, so we can say yes to living lives that are fully alive. I want to close with this. One of my favorite parts of being a headmaster at Great Hearts is getting to talk to your parents. And so um, I know that you all have wonderful parents and faculty here at Great Hearts. And, uh, and I, am, I am so, um, I'm always so blessed when I get to talk to your moms and dads. So every year, as we are inviting um, people to come to our, uh, to our high school, I bring the parents at my own community. These are our houses. Those are our house flags. You can ask me about our houses afterwards. I can tell you more about it. I think, um, I think, we, have, I think we have some similar, um, some similar uh, fun, but I think the Western Hills houses are just the best. So the parents come up on the stage, and I ask them this. <coughs> what makes you most happy about having your kids at Great Hearts? Now, I think that they're going to say to me every year, I'm always thinking they're going to say something to me like, oh, you know, the 100% college admissions or the high SAT scores or all the scholarships that the kids get, or maybe they're going to talk about the, you know, the really excellent um, uh, core reading list and curriculum, and, and they do love all of those things. But every single year, do you know what Great Hearts parents say about their kids? What is the best thing about sending your kids to the school? They say, I really love being with my kids. They are excellent human beings. Instead of being alone together, they are together, together. And we say no to something very, very small in Great Hearts, so we can say yes to something so much more. These are your friends. Um, I hope you can meet them someday. This is my son here in the front, the one who looks like me with the blonde hair. That's Benjamin. He's a ninth grader. These are our ninth graders at Great Hearts Earning after the homecoming dance. And they asked if the moms could take them to Brahms to have copious amounts of ice cream. And of course, we said yes. But I want to show this picture because I want you to notice how they're being in the world, how they're sitting. They're sitting in a circle, aren't they? Like Great Hearts High School students sit in a circle for two hours every single day in humane letters. They're not having their phones out. They're not being mediated by the machine. They're enjoying really good company, really great conversation, hilarious jokes, and meaningful relationships. They're living into a story that is bigger than themselves. They're saying no to something very, very small so that they can say yes to very to so much more. 
I gave a similar talk at our academy in, um, in Irving, and one of our scholars from the upper school sent me this in reflection.